So the first diagnostic that we are going to talk about is basically oil wire. So unlike the what would you think that this is basically just pipeline of smokes before the inlet of the wind tunnel sending air or smoke into the wind tunnel. The problem with that is the smoke will diffuse. The diffusion will basically make the lines a little bit bigger, wider, and not as sharp as those lines. To make the line that sharp, you know, it's easier or better to actually put them just before the model. The smoke is generated just before the bird or the model. So how do you do this? You cannot basically put pipeline in front of the model in that you are disturbing the test section. So you want to do this with the smallest disturbance to the flow ever by putting a very thin wire. That wire is less than a millimeter. It's 0.3 millimeter or something. Very, very thin wire. Chrome, nickel wire or something. And so that wire, you could actually dip it in oil and bring it out. Or there are more sophisticated mechanism where the wire is continuously being pulled out of the test section and new wire is coming in and before that wire coming in is being brushed against a basically uh, some kind of oil a brush with oil or some kind of feeding mechanism that's dripping oil into it the point is that wire has a thin film of oil and the oil would basically because of the surface tension will lump itself into droplets and when you bust the voltage, when you put the voltage on this thing, huh, those problems become really hot, they will start to smoke. And out of each one of them will come a smoke filament. And of course, the higher the velocity, the more you want to generate, the more smoke you want to generate, the more voltage you want to create. The so it's really nice for the small velocity, it becomes very challenging at high velocity. But the results, as you can see, it's really very, uh, very nice. And again, you could try injecting at the beginning of the wind tunnel from large uh, large pipes. But then you just worry about how, cons how sharp they will be at the end, right? And whether they really be pulled into this line or they will be everywhere, okay? So what, how does the picture look like? Bunch of line, what's needed? Wire, DC source, oil, Probably a very, uh, some people uh, record basically glycerol, they use glycerol to burn, some people use uh, uh, kind of like light oil. The problem, the danger of course is that if say if you use gasoline or something, you are risking fire, right? You could actually start a fire in the tunnel. But I mean look at the results, those streamline by themselves are really amazing because you can see where is the separation point and even if there is a separation and then reattachment and then there's kind of a separation bubble. So it's very uh, informative to look at those streamlines. All right? And this is the, the plate normal to the camera rather than basically where it's the flow is going on top of the bottom. Now the flow is just basically on the flat plate. And you can see how the boundary layer turn into turbulent. Basically all the, the lines basically start making all those vortices and creating turbulent in the flow, right? And so this is a huge wind tunnel and we will basically just feed the smoke from the, from a hose. This guy is actually inside the wind tunnel, kind of. This guy is outside, probably looking from the window on the model, right? This guy, you can see his hair is being blown. This guy also, so th those are sitting. So actually, just like this week, I was watching uh, someone driving a Mercedes and they had the, out of the windshield, they come this thing that basically send the air on top of them so that if someone is sitting, they basically their hair don't get blown by the wind. So it's really very cool, right? So you can see how they managed to do it by basically checking the streamline and make sure that the air does not get circulate inside, right? And a bunch of smoke lines so that you can track all of them. And here you can basically make the surface itself generate the smoke, right? Maybe a dye or something that once exposed to the air is start to sending smoke, whether it's like condensed milk. If this was in water, they put condensed milk over here and they let it basically very dense, but the water will start pulling it so that you can see what happened to it. Or the whole thing is out, the jet, the whole jet is out of smoke that you can make him flourish and you can see then 
the vertical structure that's forming out of say an eddy injected in in air all right and here so you see the vortex coming from the tip of the they just had kind of a plume rising from the runway and then when the airplane came by the plume basically starts circulating by itself all right and this one this is basically that wave is attached to the airplane okay it's not like it's uh, crossing a, a cloud or something no what happened is that as the airplane is flying it it generates pressure wave and the pressure suddenly change across that thin line and so if in a very humid air when you drop the density the pressure immediately that basically make the water condense make droplets and so this is basically flying with it all right as it moves to different places that place basically where the pressure really drop immediately and the water condense is basically flying with the airplane all right you can also generate streamline inside the water by uh, by realizing that the water H to O can basically be split into O H and H. If you apply a voltage in the water and make sure that the water had a little bit of salt so that the ions can move freely inside, what will happen is that all the H ion will come here, join together, make H2, that's a small bubble. Right, and that small bubble basically start because it's so tiny, it will move with the water. Right, so this was the first flow visualization that I've seen when I was undergrad. I still remember that moment. I it was on in a small water table, and I I saw the the wake behind the bluff body, and it was circulating, and I immediately sat next to it on the floor to watch it because it was so pretty. And my friends still tease me with this till this moment. It, 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 you can really see the streamline with those small hydrogen bubbles. Okay, because because again they are so small, that's the criteria. All those smoke particles are actually oil droplets. Over here, it's hydrogen bubble because they are so small they don't have their own inertia. Right, they just being blown by the water or the air in case of the wind tunnel. All right, and you can see then the. That's, uh, this is a cylinder, and this is a flow behind the cylinder. You can see what you are seeing over here is the wake behind the cylinder, <coughs> right? In water. So what's the equipment that needed? Wire, salt in the water, and, and again, a DC sort that will split the water into ions. That's all you need. And the picture would look something like this. Right? And all those are all streamline of water, uh, sorry, hydrogen bubbles. Right? Of course, in water flow, you can always use dye. The, diff the problem with the dye, however, is the diffusion. That after a while, the dye will spread everywhere. It will not trace that long unless it's very, very condensed. Okay. And high-speed imaging, of course, is very useful for us in fluid mechanics, right? Because we c it can, can let us see things that we wouldn't really see with our uh, eye. All right. And uh, you will see, like, see, this is an oil milk droplet dropping in the water, and basically, what the sequence of events that will happen. You still create a, a crown, and that crown basically, you need droplets, and then eventually it pulls down. Or you can watch bubbles with that, and especially bubbles in non Newtonian fluid, really amazing structure form. And those are useful just for, not just for the physics of the of bubbling flow itself, but also for checking our models of Newtonian fluid and how we can model the shear stress and whether the Vursex equation with our new viscosity can really duplicate this. So those are really good test cases for our model that then once we trust the model, then we can apply to a catch-up pipeline or a crude oil uh, in a distilling uh, station, distilling station or something. Right? And before high-speed camera, we used to have something called drum cameras. So those were cam the film would basically be spread on a drum. And that drum would be spinning so quickly. And then we open the lens. And now the picture would come, but the film itself is moving so quickly so the, the film would be printed, or the picture would be printed on that frame, and then that frame, and that frame, and that frame. So depending on how quickly the drum is moving, you will basically get kind of high-speed movie, at very high speed, right? Of course, you will end up with a film, and you have to develop the film. 
And so you spend all your time basically at Kinko's or whatever the camp, the place where you're developing your film. So actually when I was a BC student, our supervisor ended up buying uh, a developing machine. We had a lab for it itself and we developed our own films rather than actually going to the to spend money over the Walmart, for example, right? And smell really bad, let me tell you. Those chemicals are not fun to play with. All right, this is called uh, shadowgraphy. So actually, I took this picture myself. And it, they picked those pictures, but I, I cleaned them a little bit. But they, they picked them on the cover of the conference, the, the, the spray and optimization conference. They end up picking those pictures. And so those are picture of basically the jet, the fuel jet in, uh, the fuel basically injection in after burn jet engine when you try to fly from someone after your tail, you wanna dump as much fuel as you can so that you generate a lot of thrust. So you basically inject them in the after burner just before the flow go outside the nozzle, you basically dump the flow in a cross flow like this. So the wind is coming this way and the fuel is, is basically hitting that way. So this is a shadow graph simply black and white picture. The, the liquid itself is the black and everything white here, that's the, the air. Those lines are basically just the, the, light, the laser light that we are using is not clean. It has, because of all the mirror that he went through and the lenses and stuff, he basically have those traces. But that, that's it. That, so the question would be something like this. I will show you this picture, tell you this was this, is this a shadow graph or x-ray or PIV? The other thing that we are going to look at right now. And the setup that this thing is is made by. So the, the setup is simply you have to send a collimated light. Okay? So the light coming from the light source, whether it's a lamp or a laser spark or anything, laser beam, you basically have to collimate this so that the light now is moving as barrier light. Alright? And then it goes through the object that's here and once it goes through the thing, the light will reflect from the jet itself and will go through the air. And then you collect the light with another lens into uh, the lens, the, the picture frame on the camera or the CCD sensor on your digital camera. So the image will just fall over here. Right? That's it. So whenever the light went through it will be white whenever the light was blocked whether because of the liquid or because of the nozzle or because of pen that you are using as a reference it will basically show us as black all right so and, and with a slight modification of something like this we will make something called Schlieren imaging so shadow graphy and Schlieren when you look at the setup the only difference is look at those two sketches that's your clue when you look at that optical setup in the exam You'll be able to tell, is it shadow graphy or Schlieren from this? This is a knife edge. It's actually a razor. You know the old razor when we used to shave with the, with those razor plates? Have even anyone used those guys? Rather than the, the Gillette uh, disposable thing, they used to have like razor plates, a thin one that you actually put them and you screw them in. Have you ever used that? Yeah. Never? Yeah. All right, so that, that. <laughs> So those, those razor plates, you can act, they are very thin, right? And you just put them here at the focal point, just under the focal point. So what happened then? Nothing would happen because over here, all the light will come at, the, at that point, right? So this, the fact that this guy is under doesn't make any difference, right? However, if there is anything with higher, people who took compressible flow realize what this thing is, right? What's that? Supersonic jet, right? Supersonic jet going under, going through a bunch of shock wave expansion wave and shock wave, compression oblique shock wave and expansion wave, and this repeat until basically this cost you kill it kind of. So th this is this is air. With your eye, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't see those waves. Those are small pressure variation. But with that setup, with that Schlieren setup, you will see it. Why? <laughs> because when the light goes through this kind of high pressure, high density, his index of refraction change, the wave 
change its direction rather than going on top of the razor plate and go through to the image film or CCD sensor or whatever it will actually it will actually where I had, I had a, a picture anyway it would actually do this I'm trying to tell you that it will focus a little bit farther down. It will focus a little bit farther down of the razor edge. And then form back again on the camera, on the camera plane or the CCD sensor. So the, the, the orange one didn't, didn't get blocked by the razor plate. But right now that blue one, half of it will get blocked. The farther you, you expand, the more of your beam will get blocked. And therefore, the picture would look, the coming over here, that place that represent the light coming from that jet or that wave will be a little bit darker. So the density variation will show up as a level of gray. All right? The higher the density, the more you will get a little bit darker and darker. Okay? Or brighter and brighter. Anyway, there will be a difference of variation of the light. And so you will be able then with Schlieren, so with, with shadow graphy you can only see large density. It's basically the difference between did the light go through or the light didn't go through. That's what shadow graphy is. Right? So of course the air and water, the light will go through them. But actually here the light doesn't go because of the surface. It basically, it's not continuous water pulp where the light can go through it. That's a cylindrical jet where the water gets blocked basically get reflected from the surface. But here, the air basically, with its different density, will manage to divert a little bit of the light, and therefore you will see a level of gray like this. Right? So what's the name of this guy again? Schlieren. All right? So I, the typical, and I did this before in the previous years, I will show them this picture and tell them, is this a Schlieren or shadow graphic? And so people that remember that shadow graphy is basically just solid and air, solid and water, those will be shadow graphy. But anything that show variation of the density like the smoke or like this, this must be Schlieren. Questions? You got it? You're not taking notes. Why did I print those stuff? You need to take notes. Good job. All right. So, so again, the shadow graphy uh, can show this, but Schlieren is the one that will basically be able to show the small details. But shock waves, you know, because they are so strong, they could show up on even a shadow graph. Okay, because it's like really a very big discontinuity in pressure. So this could actually, so this by itself, you couldn't tell is it, if, I, if the picture is this and this, you, it could be a shadow graph. Okay, shadow graph can show shock waves. Right? But those are definitely Schlieren imaging. Right, so come Rainbow Schlieren. So Rainbow Schlieren not just turn the density into level of gray, it turned the rim, it turned the density variation into ra range of colors or a color scheme. So how is that possible? Can anyone invent that technique for me? So we, we said the difference between shadow graph and Schlieren is this knife edge and basically its ability to, if the light kind of get blocked a little bit or coming like here, that basically will block part of it and will make the picture a little bit darker or brighter depending on the density. So how you turn this into rainbow color? That's a great idea, but no, they don't do it this way. What else they do? Because th what's wrong with the prism is that the light will go everywhere. I still want my picture on my camera. Huh? But, but that would be, so I'm saying let's take picture with green and lecture picture with blue. It will show up exactly the same, right? It's just different.
Yeah. So you're saying, let, let's do it uh, numerically? That's a great idea, but no, they don't do it this way. But that's a good idea. The knife edge is not a knife edge. Instead, it is What do you think? It's translucent, right? It's a transparent with color pattern into it. And so as the light go hit different places into it, depending on the density variation, he basically come out with different color, kind of, right? So they will end up with, of course, then they will have to uh, calibrate this. They basically need to realize what is purple and what's green and what's stuff, right? But anyway, they will be able to tell. So again, color slurring imaging. So that's a flame hitting a drum. So to be able to tell the density, which is the temperature, right? The white density is different. It's all atmospheric pressure in that place, in a flame like this. It's not like shock wave with different uh, pressure that, no, now it's the same pressure, but different temperature. So now the temperature change the density, and the density change the index of refraction, and that change where you will end up hitting the filter, and that will change the color on the, yes. This guy? This? Yes. If that wasn't... This is in a wind tunnel, by the way, right? Right. So this is the model in the wind tunnel, and they're looking at the waves forming from it. Right. If it wasn't in color, those shock waves could show up with their normal uh, shatterography. So shadowgraphy will, will basically be able to get this guy, the biggest one. But all the tiny one, will not. you will not be able to get them with shadowgraphy. You need Schlieren to see them. So shadowgraphy can, can show the bullet, can show the strongest. I know this because I, I took picture myself like this with the, with the shock wave, and I can see the shock wave coming. But I never see all the other waves that the other weaker compression wave, they wouldn't show up. Okay, because if, like on the handouts we have, they're black and white. So I'm just wondering, like on a test situation, if we saw that picture there. If yeah, I, I, printed, I printed my exam in color pictures before because of that. No, no, so the exam can come, this one, one beige could come in color for you in the exam. Yeah, no, I was just, but if it was black and white and say... Right, so you can tell from... Those, those small shockwaves off right. the side would make it... So our own question is, be, can you tell us, can you give us a picture in the black and white paper and tell us, is this a rainbow Schlieren or regular Schlieren? No, I can't, of course. No, you cannot tell. I mean, like, I'm just... The front wave would show up under yes. shatterography, but those back waves would not. But they will show under normal Schlieren, gray and level Schlieren, like this. See, okay. this is Schlieren, and all those guys are showing up, and they are really weak, but still they show up. Okay. So Schlieren imaging will show all the weak waves. As long as there is the smallest change in pressure, he will show them. Shadowgraph will only show the main big one, the strong one only. Okay. Of course, this is very qualitative, you know, like I need to provide you with more numbers, like what is the prick, what is the cut line for shadowgraphy not to fail to show or not. But I, I don't have that number on top of my head. Like how, how large will the shock wave should be in order to be able to, to register as on a Schlieren? It has to do with the resolution of the film, right? And so the, the film, for example, that I used to take this picture, is actually equivalent to using 120 megapixel camera, which we don't have yet, right? The best megapixel camera we have at Walmart right now is what, like 16? Or how much do they make them right now? Who buys huh? Who buys well, it's like 16 megapixel or something. That's how large they are. But, but this is equivalent to 120 megapixel because they have so many grains on the film that you can basically be able to see the smallest change in the pressure. Right? Okay, so we finished rainbow learning, right? So now PIV. This is basically what people use to get velocity measurements in the wind tunnel and 
And so the whole idea is that you generate a laser sheet, a sheet of light. So the light actually get generated as a, from all those laser as, as a beam, round beam, eight millimeter for the large one, two millimeter, one millimeter for the small one, like your laser pointer. And then you send it through a cylindrical, cylindrical lens, it's not spherical lens. Spherical lens is just like those guys. Cylindrical lens will turn the round sheet into, sorry, the round beam into a sheet. And so that light basically gets sent into the wind tunnel, right? It eliminates the wind tunnel. And then the wind tunnel would have seeding particles inside the wind tunnel, okay? Smoke particles, titanium particles. Sometimes people send choke powder. Things that when they hit the light, the camera will see those particles. And you will get two pictures, just like this. And when you compare those two pictures, you realize that they have what happened? They kind of moved, right? Those guys are here and those guys are here. And that's what the software looking at those two pictures will, will do. He will look at those two guys, two pictures. So obviously you need two pictures. You need the camera to take two pictures. You need the laser to fire twice. Or you need two lasers. That's what happened actually. You have two lasers and each one of them will fire. And the camera will take two pictures. And the two pictures will be like this. And you compare them, or the software would compare them, and the, he would say, I think they move to the right with five meter per second. Ariane. What did you use to take the picture for your, well, this one's the one that was yours? What did I, how did I take it? So that's five inch by four inch film. So that's a huge film. Can you remember the old film where that was like 35 millimeter? No, this one is five inch by four inch. This is how big it is. And so we, we had its own cartridge where you put the film in, and then we turn off the light in the lab. It's completely dark. No one can see anything. And we open the camera. So now the camera is sensitive to the light, but there is no light in the lab, nothing. And then we fire the laser. And so the laser come for five nanoseconds. That's how quick the laser is. And that's why we like it for imaging. Because it's so quick, you would basically take a frozen image. So no matter how quickly those guys are moving, Huh? No matter how quickly they are moving, you get a frozen image. If the camera stay open so long, the picture will be blurry because the thing will be moving. So if you are taking a picture of a soccer player and you see his feet in different places hitting the, you don't want to see this. So rather than having a very fast shutter, instead we let the light source itself be the shutter. Right? So imagine you open the camera. But there is no light. So it doesn't really matter whether the camera will be open five minutes or five hours. There is no light in the lab. All right? And then the light comes only for five nanoseconds, and that's how you take the picture. So to answer your question, this was five inch by four inch polaroid film. Right? And you need light source, a quick light source. So the, the laser are very expensive, but then there is also very quick pulsing sources, a flash lamp. They call them flash lamp. And so you can get one like thousands of dollars compared to the laser is like 35, but the flash lamp would be only a few thousands, all right? So that it can fire, basically just send you a, a very quick burst of light. All right, so back again to the PIV. So PIV stands for Particle Image Velocimetry. Particle Image Velocimetry. And that's exactly what we did. We took an image of the particles in the air, and so, Implicitly, the assumption that those particles are so tiny huh, that, again, they don't have an inertia of their own. They wouldn't go to the right and they will go to the left. No, they will go with the air. The, the air will circulate, they will circulate with it. So the, it's very important that those particles are very, very small. Right? So in, in our lab here in, in Tulsa, we use oil. Olive oil. We, we break it into tiny droplets, 10 micrometer, and they, they fly with the air. But in other applications, the oil would burn. Say in, in, you're trying to do BIV inside a flame. <coughs> maybe this will burn. So maybe you need to switch to something that wouldn't burn, like titanium oxide, particles of titanium oxide, for example, something that wouldn't really burn and still small enough that they will fly with the air. Right? So again, 
in the final what's needed is I'll show you the picture and tell you what did this picture come from and what's needed to take this picture or this technique so the picture will look something like this okay or this this is the PIV image of the jet okay those are the seeding particles and why they are shining like this because of light the laser sheet that's going through them all right and so there will be two picture of this and two picture of this i mean this is a jet this is just in the middle of the flow all right so you you need this or the software need basically always a pair of those pictures so that you can analyze them and tell that the velocity vector is like this and then you he basically can after he plot the velocity vector he can even calculate the circulation he can tell you well there is a vortex over here and there's vortex over there because he can see the velocity vectors so how does the software looking at those two images will tell and so the picture when you zoom in it's like this the particles if I zoom in here a little bit see the particles are not just will not show up on the camera just like total black right or total white they will have some kind of gray it really depends, are they in the middle of the sheet or a little bit far out, out of the sheet or, right? So when they are really very bright like this, that means they are getting a lot of light and they are reflecting very strongly. Then we get scared from the, on the camera. We are worried that the camera is getting too much light. It's as if you are looking at the sun. So when I was a student, actually the, the, the guy who was training me, we wouldn't be looking at this. We would be looking at the, numbers that the picture represent you know it's as if looking to the matrix you remember the movie the matrix when they were looking to the people as numbers so that's how you look to the images we were looking to the image basically as numbers so that because if the if the pixel is very bright he will hit 4095 for example and that tells us that this pixel is going to burn right now so we we have to tune down our laser so that we can make sure that no place in this screen there is any hot pixels right but my point is that the pixel are basically numbers each one of those pixels are reporting 2000 3000 and if there is nothing it's just zero zero or five or three so then the computer look at this and this and he multiply them by each other and he this is two matrices he multiply them and he can clear the determined so just element by element what do you think he will get if you multiply each pixel by the other pixel from the other camera and add all the number, what you will get at the end for a free quiz? But what is the number you will get? One, no. Zero. Who gets zero? Free quiz. If you tell me why. Because <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't one. Because it wasn't one. Because of the path, it goes back to zero. Kind of like. Uh, no. Why when I multiply this picture, time this picture, and add, I will get zero? Almost zero. Not exactly zero. Because this particle in the second shot will be moving, right? No, not, not a single particle will be in its place. So chances are the place where you are is now empty. And the place where you came in was empty before, right? in general that's the tradition or that's what will happen so when you multiply them each particle will end up falling on an empty space in the previous picture right so you'll get a zero except so this is the, the, the multiplication result this is done for different x and y by that I mean he first shift this picture before he multiplied. So he first say, let's shift it one pixel and one pixel. One pixel in the Y, one pixel in the X, and then multiply. And then he try again, two pixels and two pixels. Three and zero. Four and minus one. Five and... So he try all combination until he get this. What is that? That is the peak that he had the jackpot. He basically managed to shift the picture in the right direction where they move, where now every particle hit an actual image of himself or itself. And that's when you get a peak in the multiplication. And that's when he tell, uh, that must be the right delta x and delta y. 
those guys have been moving into this direction with 5 meter per second in the y direction and 3 meter per second in the x direction and he get the, the velocity vector and he do this for all the interrogation window until he get basically the whole velocity field right so what are the so again what is the image, the picture look like bunch of sparkling particles like this okay sometimes they will show the large scale structure but that's not really a good picture for biv a good picture for biv would be like this because you want the software to be able to see individual particle not chunk of particles right so a good picture of biv would be will doesn't really make sense it will just be a cloud of particles right and what are the equipment needed? Well, YAG laser, India YAG laser. Why we like it? Because it's so quick. It's the five nanosecond. That's what we like about it. Okay? Just fire for five nanosecond, and before that and after that, there's no light. So the picture, no matter how quickly the flow is, will be frozen. And actually, the YAG light is infrared. It's 1064. Uh, you wouldn't see this. Right? You wouldn't see it. But then we had a crystal that basically double the 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 frequency and make it 532. 532 that's a green. That's what we then send to the to the particle so that we can see. Because the camera, just like our eye, are actually very sensitive to the green. And so that's also a problem. That yeah, laser can burn a hole into your eye. And they, they had this three really nice t-shirt that say uh as a warning, don't look to the laser with the only remaining eye you have. I mean, it's okay to burn one eye, but I mean, keep the last one, don't. <laughs> all right. So that's why when you see to go to the lab, you see all those like, be aware, dangerous light coming from the. So the, you don't want to let it go through your eye, okay? But the, but sometimes even the diffusion or the sparkling light coming reflected, if it's really strong, that's also bad. It's like as if you're looking at someone welding. You don't want to look to anyone welding, right? And we need a camera. So we need a laser to generate the sheet, and we need a camera, all right? And there are two kinds of camera. There are CMOS camera and CCD camera, and those usually are very fast compared to those ones. And, of course, you need the sparkling particles that you will basically be able to trace them between the two pictures, right? And so traditionally, we, we just use smoke out of uh, olive oil. Last year, there was this one student, actually, he made an, a, a really excellent smoker out of, he had a cat litter box. He took out the cat litter, of course, but then he filled the cat litter with ice cubes. And then he sent air inside the ice. And so by the time the air come, he had very uh, humid air va water vapor coming out of it. It was very cold, and he it came as basically a perfect smoker. He was trying to trace the vortex coming from a, a helicopter wing. So in the lab, we had this small helicopter with double wings, double rotors, and he wanted to see how does the vortex from the first one hit the second one. And so he basically smoked it with, basically made this trace of smoke and he could actually see it. So people do all kinds of things to be able to see that flow. Dr. Jimmy Jacob, for example, our own Jimmy Jacob, some, one time he had to, to see the flow in a mine. They want to make sure that the ventilation in the mine was really great or not. So they end up crunching choke and throw it in the air and shine on the light on them so that they can see. People also, sometimes they use fluorescent uh, seeding particles. So those, those are very expensive, okay, but they're worth the price because you shine green on them, that's your laser, and then they shine back in red. So if you have a camera here, if you have a camera sitting over here with a red filter on top of it, that filter will not, be, will not see the green light coming from the reflection. So one problem with this laser is that you try to eliminate the wind tunnel so that you can see the smoke, but then the light reflects back from the wing, the airplane, the ceiling, and, and the camera is overwhelmed. The camera cannot really see the particles. There's just too much reflection. But with, with those guys, if you had the red filter in front of the camera, you will only see the particle, and everything else would be basically as if it's not there. Right? 
So that solves the problem of reflection. This is called stereo, PIV. And, and your clue to see that, so I'll show you this picture. Actually, I, I showed this picture in one exam. I told them, is that PIV or stereo PIV? So I see a egg laser, I see a camera. Then I could say this is a PIV, right? We said the PIV is basically a camera and a egg laser, and we are done. But because there are two cameras, that's what makes this stereo BIV. What is stereo BIV? We need, notes that the PIV will give us the velocity in X and Y, right? The X and Y component, we will just get U and V. Is there is any way we can get W out of this? Imagine, imagine a laser, laser sheet and particle moving and you are getting two pictures. Is there is any way you can get the Z component? So, you, but not instant, so not uh, simultaneously, right? I mean, you really have to shine it like this and look from the top to see that to see that component, right? But out of one sheet, you will not be able to to see the Z component. So, what do they do is? They actually make, it's kind of really what Millery said, but rather than moving the sheet back and, and forth, we make a, we make a, we make a sec sheet. The sheet is not very thin. The sheet is actually the sheet is a little bit thick, so that the particles in here will end up showing up even if you move normal to the camera, normal to the sheet. The particle will still be eliminated between the two shots, and then you have two cameras, not just one, right? So what you have is two cameras. And so he's saying that for a particle like this, moving between one and two, one camera will basically see him moving between this and this, and the other camera will see him moving between here and here. Each camera is looking at its own projection. And so the software basically analyzing the picture from the two cameras, one camera will tell him this particle at that place, you know, because the screen is divided into squares. so. One camera tell him this the particle in that square or the particle because it actually if you see they do an average. It's not just the result is not one particle, it's the average of the particle in that picture. Right? Right? See we, the the picture has a bunch of particle. And the software is basically saying on average in that square I think things are moving to the right with five meter per second. So with two cameras he will get two vectors from the same place, okay? And then he will basically pull them together to say, uh, then it's in 3D, it must be, here's X, Y, and Z. He get the C component out of those two velocity projections. All right? So again, in the exam, when, when you basically realize there are two cameras and, and the laser sheet, and then I will tell you, is this a PIV or stereo PIV? And something else that's Schlieren imaging you will realize this must be a stereo PIV because it has the two cameras. All right? So now there is something called cinema PIV. All right? Cinematographic PIV. Another name for it, time resolved PIV. So what are, all those are the same thing. Time resolved PIV, cinema PIV, all those things basically mean that the camera is working so fast and the laser is firing so quickly that you don't just get two pictures so that you can get velocity out of them, but you get a movie of pictures, a continuous movie of pictures. So that's why it's called time resolved, right? So this time resolved basically tell us not just doesn't give us a snapshot of how does the velocity field look like around an airfoil, but basically continuous 
Huh? Movie of how, what happened to the flow field. So how could you tell if you're looking to something like this? It's basically the camera. If you look at the camera and it's a high-speed camera, CMOS camera, that's high-speed camera. Unlike the CCD, which is much quick, uh, weaker. Also, the, the laser, you're almost done. Yeah. And that, that the, the PIV laser was YAG laser. ND YAG laser. ND stands for nadmium, uh, nadmium, cadmium. This is called, either I will tell you the frame rate, or basically I will tell you ND ELF. See, this is called ND ELF laser. Or the frame rate. The frame rate of the egg laser is 10 hertz. You take fire 10 times per second. That's so slow, right? This guy is firing at 10 kilohertz, 10 thousands faster than this. Right? So that's your clue that this is basically PIV and not, sorry, time is all PIV and not just regular PIV.